Oh, hey, didn't see you there. I have a confession. I went to Burger King and told them it was my birthday, and they gave me one of those, like, paper crowns, and just... Don't worry, I buried the crown already in the front yard. But how can I get over that gill? I mean... <laughs> I ate at Burger King! Guilty Crown, an anime original property produced by Production IG with director Tosuro Araki, the same person responsible for Attack on Titan, Death Note, and High School of the Dead, started in 2011, and then ended in 2012 with a 22 episode run, and man let me tell you I love this show and it seems like that is a divisive opinion. Did you see the sign? While there are very, very valid reasons for disliking the series, and some I disagree with, let's put that on hold for a second and talk about the plot. This series takes place in an alternate reality where Japan's kinda under rule due to it desperately needing help from damage it took from the apocalypse virus. And there's a terrorist organization trying to liberate Japan, and due to the main character bumping into a unique girl and getting powers indirectly from her, he's able to help the organization- Wait, when did I start using Code Geass footage? Geass? I thought it was called Code Goose. So one of the first issues, and one that's really hard to argue, is the fact that the anime Code Geass and Guilty Crown have very similar starting premises. The biggest initial difference is Guilty Crown is against the organization known as GDQ and Code Geass is against Britannia. Oh yeah, the biggest evil in the world. The British. While it does have some pretty big similarities, I think as far as writing is concerned, the biggest difference between the two shows is the characters and their dynamic with the protagonist. As well as the protagonist himself, but we can get to him in a bit. In regards of other characters, there's the very iconic Inori who, if you ever seen anything Guilty Crown, it's probably her, and for good reason. A, overall design, but she also is used for a while as the mascot of the band Egoist, and again, for good reason. That band, which consists of the existing band Supercell and the singer Chelvy, was actually formed due to Guilty Crown, and is a band with industry series of the show. Which is honestly so cool because 10 years after the show has been done and over with, Egoist is still releasing music so hey, there's that. I mean, Egoist music is really good, but do they have to be so arrogant? I mean, come on, Ego is in their name. There's Guy, who's the leader of Funeral Parlor, at least in the first half. He's super charismatic and cooler than you and I ever could be. There's ISA, who pilots the mech for Funeral Parlor, because, I mean, if the budget of the show says, hey, you can add robots, you better add robots. There's Sugumi, and I'm pretty sure hacking doesn't look like that. I can't crack this code, I don't have my cat ears. There's Harley, who is a fantastic support for Shu, and then lastly, at least for who I want to mention, is the main character, Shu Oma. Usually at the top of the list of people's issues with the series, he doesn't fit into all of other anime protagonists, where he isn't naturally talented or strong willed or anything like that. He's normally pretty whiny and can be annoying at times, but if you ask me, Shu is one of the best parts of the series. I mean, come on guys, you want to be mean to him for being weak, but hey, if the Shu was on the other foot... <laughs> That wasn't even funny. But if that doesn't convince you, what if I told you the staff considers Shu a less passive version of Shinji from Neon Genesis? Wait, that does not help. I do understand the frustration around Shu, but I really do like him. His motives and behaviors contradict at times, but I take that as more of a he contradicts himself because he's human. Is he a perfectly written character? Of course not. But he is a character that can and will make mistakes and try to correct them, or not realize when what he's doing is wrong. I understand if the concept isn't for you. Honestly, there are characters of the same archetype that frustrate the hell out of me, but I at the very least love Shuoma and the way he bounces between behaviors throughout the series. Okay, enough about that boring nerd. How about we talk about the real best character? His name is Dan Eagleman. I swear to God that is his name. He speaks in mostly football references and he makes me so proud of my country. With all that set up, let's take a look at the first episode and see how it initially hooked so many people. We open instantly with an establishing shot of a city and a soon-to-be well-known song to anyone who's watched the series. We cut to Shuoma watching a YouTube performance of Inori, and come on, couldn't have picked something better? There we go. But the song continues to play, and that's when we see where Inori is right now, which is running through her sewer with a mysterious vial. Not unlike how the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle started. We get splices between the video of Inori, her doing dangerous stuff with mechs, and a plain old ordinary shoe. Inori makes her way out with the help of another mech while more splicing happens, but then she gets knocked off the bridge, and that's when the show for the most part ends that segment. Cut to an ordinary life of Shu and Hare riding on a train where they see signs of what happened. I still don't understand why they sent Inori on the stealth mission when she's clearly famous. It's like, God, who can we get undercover? Markiplier. 
We see that Shu in his classroom talking to two people, but then it kind of goes into him talking about how he isn't good in social situations. He goes into an abandoned building that he hangs out in, and honestly, I'd have the same reaction at this point in time. The way she's acting right now is a whole, like, offering that makes you kind of wonder, is she just a wee bit weird, or is there something there? Shu gets a vision, and when military grabs Inori, I'm a level of you, Shu has the most natural reaction of, oh sh they have guns. He's saying things that go, how I should have done something different. What were you supposed to do? They had guns! He mopes around for a bit, but gets told the location of where he can help her in some way. On his way there, though, Shu almost gets the hell beaten out of him, but then we might get the coolest guy since sliced bread, and you can tell by his long coat that he means business. But you know, I cannot get over how fluid the animation in this fight is. The choreography is just amazing. Shu meets the cast over here, but when the area gets a fatal case of explosions, Shu is in charge of protecting that vial of good old action stuff. Inori is out in the open, and when saving her, the events of the series are aligned to go ahead. And we get one of the best power awakening sequences in years without the uncomfortable subtext, but who cares about being uncomfortable because the song in the background, oh my god. And then Shu pulls the sword out of her chest. Is that what second base is? And we get an answer to the age-old question of nothing can beat an anime boy with a sword. And credits. I feel like this episode does a near-perfect job at hooking people. It establishes Shu as a realistic coward, but willing to put himself in danger. And it shows a lot of mysteries that are going to be revealed in the show's runtime. And that is the best way I've spent 22 minutes in the past 22 minutes. There are a lot of interesting aspects of the world of Guilty Crown. The somewhat futuristic city looks so cool, but also so livable. And the way voids work. It's a really cool power that Shu has, where it basically takes a manifestation of someone's soul of anyone under 17 for some reason. I am curious about how the power knows that, but it's a great way to reveal character details of the show, even to the point where it makes characters reflect on themselves seeing their void, or hearing about it. And, I am so damn curious about the faceless character whose soul was a fridge! I wonder if there was any soul milk. But the most commonly acclaimed parts of this series is the animation and the music being incredible. This is both for the openings, which somehow cap captures each half a series amazingly well, as just the series itself. Each major scene is normally accompanied with dramatic music that either plays into the seriousness, and I am genuinely using this word, or the epicness of the scene. They always look like art and movement, and I just... Ah, the music's so damn good, and I've been consistently listening to these songs from 10 years ago when I first watched the show. Which, in case I go too long without listening to it, I always carry an in case of emergency soundtrack on me. While other shows have come out that also have really hard-hitting iconic music and beautiful animation, which honestly isn't something that really happens nowadays with studios like Ufotable and MAPPA, just dropping the most beautifully animated sequences of the year each and every year, Guilty Crown still holds a special place in my heart because the scenes feel unique to the series beyond just animation, and I have a good reason to say that. It's called... Being biased. Guilty Crown was the show that when I first watched it, I fell in love with it, and it wasn't until I got older that I found some of the issues with the series, but that didn't take away the positives that I loved the series for. Like the world building and character writing, and I will stick to that opinion. At the end of the day, you can probably give me an entire list of shows that are objectively better than Guilty Crown, but only my show has Dan Eagleman in it. Let's see how much weight that adds to the tier list.